Good evening. Thank you all for coming. Welcome to We Are People's Here's Town Hall Meeting, where we will be discussing foreclosures and how the banks don't win unless we let them. My name is Ada Brown. I'm a member of We Are People Here's Executive Committee. By the way, this evening's town hall is being live broadcast on Sanjeev's and soon to be our YouTube channel. So that's what's happening down here. We're very happy to have this next step of, of technology working for us. Tonight we'll hear from a panel of foreclosure law researchers, activists, and homeowners experienced in fighting foreclosures. Chris Clements will speak, followed by Linda Durham, Mukti R. Singh Khalsa, and Robert Jaynes. Following the presentations, there will be a Q&A session. So please write your questions on the index card, your remarks, and share his thoughts about some of our next steps. We're also very pleased to have with us a HUD-certified housing counselor and a representative from United South Broadway in Albuquerque. They provide services statewide. They are funded by the New Mexico Attorney General's Office on Home Preservation and other sources. Their mission is to assist homeowners in foreclosure defense and to help lift the burden on homeowners that may be in or facing foreclosure. You can visit the services that they offer. Muktiar Singh Khalsa and Robert Jaynes will also be available at tables in the foyer to answer questions and to provide further access to their materials. Now I want to introduce Craig Barnes. Craig's the founder of We Are People Here. He's an author, radio host, playwright, a retired attorney who's been promoting social and economic justice for many years. We're truly grateful for his leadership. Uh, excuse me, he'll open our town hall conversation by putting the foreclosure issue into the context of We Are People Here's broader mission. Craig? Thank you, Ada. Thank you, Ada. Good evening, friends, and welcome. It's great to see you all here. Uh, thanks for coming. We meet tonight while our nation flounders, as Shakespeare might say, in a sea of troubles. First, the anti-government religionists in the U.S. House of Representatives will welcome a shutdown of government as a matter of principle and a way to show their clout and bravado. Most of these members come from gerrymandered districts that are insulated from national opinion, and these members look forward to the promised land when they will see a shrinking away of the federal government and a rise of unregulated riches, wealth untrammeled by cares, no care for the larger public interest, no care for democracy's longer future of the least among us. Those who would close down the government are unburdened by doubt, clothed in abundant righteousness, deaf to the counsel of elders, insensitive to the poor, and provided with complete, complete health insurance for themselves, immune from the slightest concern for the health of others. They will take the country down before they will budge on their own holy principles that include the defeat of Obama, unwinding of government, and most of all, the demise of health care, which will be for them the defeat of sloth and irritation against the suffering of the majority. They will, like Dostoevsky's great grand inquisitor, hide behind righteousness. The anti-government loyalists remind me of a time when I was working in the Soviet Union and one of my Russian colleagues relayed to me a conversation he had had only a week before with an assembled group of Soviet generals. My colleague, who was a distinguished author, filmmaker, an intensely decent man, said that he had form informed these high-ranking generals who were sitting about the table in their metal bedecked uniforms with some glee. Yes, it will be awful. Civilization will end, but we will have won the war. <laughs> That's a true story. Politicians who would close down the government sound a good deal like those Soviet generals. They are so locked into the excitement of a short-term victory over Obama that they don't mind the virtual destruction of the government in which they serve. Thus it is that we face this autumn a paralyzed Congress, a weakened president, and little hope for in debt 
or small businesses that cannot get loans. We have a liquidity crisis, yet we have corporations sitting on record profits, holding massive cash in reserve, and at the same time we have a government unable to fund the repair of its bridges to maintain equal educational opportunity, foster upward mobility out of poverty, promote science, or create conditions in which any but the very riches, richest are prospering. And that is the short definition of the sea of troubles in which we find ourselves tonight. Because this is not for you a crisis in the abstract, this is a real crisis in your real lives. For many of you, your homes are at risk. So tonight we will have a discussion about what some others in foreclosure are doing and some successes they are having. We have some speakers who will talk about some of their experiences and some of the options that you personally may want to explore. We hope that when you go home tonight you will realize that you are not alone and may have found some useful people to talk to. We this podium cannot be telling or even suggesting to anyone what he or she should do in a legal proceeding. Please be clear, to get legal advice you need to consult a lawyer. You will how not get that here tonight unless you actually talk to some lawyers, and we have some in the room, those people who are lawyers, and you must speak to them to get legal counsel. And we are people here. We are going after foreclosures because they represent the callous inhumanity of the extractive sucking machine that is called the financial industry and that is run substantially by the global banks. Foreclosures represent the end game of the giant banks when their derivative cas cas casinos have gone bad. When these giants have gambled too much and your payments are no longer enough to support them in their multi-trillion dollar habit, they turn to you to take your, their, your homes. They don't mind if you lose hundreds of thousands of dollars in equity, they will claim your equity, equity, and when the market recovers, they will sell your equity to someone new and start the interest-sucking machine in motion again from which they gamble in the, casino, in the casinos of derivatives all over again. And here's the kicker. Say you are not in foreclosure. You are just a depositor in good shape. You put money in and you don't take out more than you put in. You are, you think, just a bystander in the foreclosure crisis. You think. You hope. Here is how even you could deprive your deposits to buy up properties spread around the country and the world, and in value many times equal to the value of your deposits. So your regions total, say your regions deposits total a, a billion dollars. The bank can leverage that billion to become a hundred billion that they can spend. They use your deposits for, as Ellen Brown says, security to le for the leveraged buyout of the nation. What they do not therefore invest in the derivative casinos, they are now investing to ports and harbors, commodities and minerals, the lifelines of America. Even therefore those of us who have not gotten into debt will not be free of our mutual assistance to the empire. Using our deposits as security, the great five banks will have America by the throat anyway as they slowly gain control of our lifelines. We are the common people of America, and we are up against an extractive, grasping, expanding legislation and the applicable regulations through campaign contributions and lobbying. Goldman Sachs spent almost $8 million on campaigns in 2011-2012. Bank of America and J.P. Morgan spent $4.5 million apiece. All these three gave contributions more or less equally to Republicans and Democrats to make sure they had access no matter who won. Every, the banks are everyone's essential ally. After the elections, according to the Center for Responsive Politics, help alone. The financial industry had over 12,000 lobbyists working for Congress in that year. These are the simple mechanics by which to, a financial empire maintains itself and renders a population helpless to fight back. When you consider the citizenship of the great global banks and ask whether they are loyal citizens of this country, remember this, the great banks are the ones who declare their income is made in the Cayman Islands, one of their 116 offshore tax havens, and sadly for them and for us, 
little income is made in the United States. So little of this bank's income was made in the U.S. that unfortunately their U.S. losses actually require them to get from us a tax refund. In 2010, Bank of America had such a hard year that they were awarded nearly one billion dollars in tax refunds. That was a year they had received 42, after they had received 42 billion dollars in a bailout of tax funds. Although the Bank of America stands out, started out in 2011 with 47 billion dollars of taxpayer fund, funds in its accounts. Accounts that may be recorded by computers anywhere in the world with no necessary computer in the United States. This is colonial power. One of the country's largest banks, the Bank of America, willing to accept the benefits of American citizenship, law, order, stability, education, and financial freedom, but accept none of our burdens. They overlay the system like the British Raj atop democracy, but not one. They live in the Caymans. They use our name America in their title, but do not accept the duties of American citizenship. This is the 19th century colonialism brought forward into the 21st century, and it is classic, extractive, and inhumane. And we are people here. We are concerned about this, A, because of the human suffering that results from giant income inequality, and B, because of the historic fact that banking consolidation, the controlling number of great banks is now down to five. Plutocracy spells the end of democracy. We are interested, and we are people here, in democracy. We are interested in all the ways we can do democracy ourselves. Here in Santa Fe, and all over New Mexico and into Colorado, breaking free from the dominance of the global giants. We are interested in linking up with the people in foreclosure and students who bear unbearable loans. We are interested in creating public banks that can fund a new local economy. We are interested in Richmond gain to take homes that are in foreclosure and then work with the homeowners to help them be able to pay back. We are interested in movements to move money from the giant global banks to local banks and credit unions. We are interested in experiments going on all around the world in the creation of alternative currencies, parallel currencies that foster local trade and local prosperity. We are interested in the practice of democracy at the local level in all the ways that creative people can think of. A vision that rides upon the shoulders of the citizens of the United States that has been told that citizenry that has been told that they, the citizens, are the ones responsible for America's troubles. The angry voices of plutocracy's media blare forth falsehoods, claiming claiming that it is our common citizens who are responsible for our national plight, responsible to make more payments, to work more jobs, to borrow more money, and we, the common citizens. Oh, this hurts. We, the common people, did not receive a bailout of $800 billion. We do not now, and year after year, refuse to pay our U.S. taxes. We do not now lobby to have derivative debts, the gambling debts, take priority over government debts and personal debts in bankruptcy. Those who argue that they have the moral upper hand in a foreclosure proceeding in court, and some of you are experiencing that, that egregious assertion, that they have the moral the righteous defense of capitalism in their hearts are, in the ancient language of the Bible, hypocrites. Woe unto them who purvey guilt and shame and divide the common people of America from one, on, one another. Woe. Hypocrites. We are here to fight this delusion that the empires of the great banks are the norm and that plutocracy is the norm and that helplessness of all our people is the norm. We see and thank you. Thank you, Craig.